what are the pitfalls and what are the things you've learned running an ICO? Do's and don'ts. The changing face of financial crime. Financial damage from crypto-related fraud has reached $2.3 billion, which is nothing compared to the estimated $2.1 trillion in cyber hacking, dark web activities, and other pervasive fiat-based risk factors in the 21st century. The gloves are off. Moderated by Kuyen Nong, A to Z Market Z. Sonia Koglani, ClearTrack. Gavin Brown, the Manchester Metropolitan University. Alfio Bardola, SkillChain. Sinjin Bent, FTI Consulting. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing? All good? Still focused? <laughs> so, before we have the start of the panel, we are, I will talk to you and go through a number of things where we've discussed and also to structure this panel, to the, you know, today's panel, in a more better way. So, the do's and don'ts of the financial crime for crypto companies and also for B2B companies in the financial markets itself. First off, we want to identify which are the financial crimes types, the fiat types, the crypto types, the different crimes types that we out have there. Furthermore, we will discuss with today's experts about how to avoid them. They've all gone through different stages throughout financial crime and faced it. So what we can learn from it and make it more practical to give it to you all today. So to give you a brief introduction again, we start here with Sonia, Gavin, Alfio, and then Sinten. I'm Sonia Gokulani, uh, run a small fintech startup based out of New York. Uh, we mainly specialize in derivatives clearing and uh, blockchain and uh, crypto assets. I still sit on the board of Wall Street Blockchain Association to run the tech and product group there. Hello, my name is Gavin Brown. I'm an associate professor at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, I'm also a co-founder and non-executive director of Winterbar Associates Limited, which is a startup digital assets uh, fund currently applying for regulatory status in the Isle of Man. Hi, I'm Alfio Bardolla from Italy, and uh, I own a listed company, and uh, I own also uh, an ICO, so we, we launch an ICO, so I can see the problem and the relationship between uh, the institutional financial problems with uh, the new world of uh, crypto. And my name is Sinjin Bent. I'm a compliance consultant with FTI Consulting. Great. So, yeah, to start off as well, my name is Quen. I'm the managing director of uh, A to Z Markets. It's a financial news platform where we have about uh, 250,000 subscribers. And um, starting off with uh, Sony as well, this is some of our reader base has been asking our community about crypto and blockchain. So um, they're very confused about the different types of financial crime. So Sonia, can you tell us more about it? So I mean, I think this whole crypto world can be kind of divided into a few segments. One is obviously the ICO side of it, for those of you who are not familiar with that side, where there are new tokens issued, and so there's crimes in that area committed which I'm sure Alfo can add more to it. Uh, then you have the actual, the trading on the different exchanges where we come in where we've seen a lot of hedging and a lot of uh, the coins are stolen or the custody aspect is, uh, is impacted in terms of where the coins stored. So there's, a, there's crime in that side. And then in the KYC side, which obviously John can put in, is you, know, you have, in terms of doing the actual KYC checks where there's a lot of money, money laundering happening, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, wars being, you know, they're using Bitcoin to buy weapons and stuff like that. So those kind of stuff, things are happening. So, and then in terms of the crypto dusting side of it, there are things happening on that side of it. So there are, there are multiple areas in that. And it's, it's an evolving area, just to give a very high level view of the, the crime that's happening in the crypto space. That's great, yeah. So in terms of the comparison and the similarities of financial crime, Maybe, Kevin, you can tell us more a bit about it. 
Yeah, so, I mean, from my perspective as an academic, um, I used to be an accountant for my sins, hence the uh, trousers and jacket that don't match. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. Um, so one of the things that, um, at an institutional level, uh, by example, we were chatting about this, uh, we were a, uh, a place where I used to work, we were a week away from investing in one of Madoff's funds, Bernie Madoff, um, and then the due diligence kicked in when on the Bloomberg TV we saw him in chains, which uh, kind of, um, was obviously a big red flag. Um, so what has that kind of example of a, you know, sort of pre-crypto type of crime or Ponzi scheme got in, in similarity with an ICO or something like that? Because often the Ponzi scheme is, you know, a, a term which is kind of thrown in the face of many ICOs, whether they be legitimate or not. Um, and, and from my experience, I think the thing that you often find is, is that the, the, the biggest or most dangerous ICOs can be the ones that have a plausible business case. Because it's very easy to often see an ICO where you just think, you know, why do you even need to tokenize? You, you're clearly doing this because it's a, an easier route to finance all this fraudulent uh, activity going on under, underneath that. I think it's much more dangerous when you start to look at the business itself and you start to see that there's some plausibility there. So the parallel with Madoff would be that he had a brokerage business and at the same time he was running a Ponzi scheme next to that. So it was much harder to see through that to the underlying core and, and that would be the, the kind of similarity and difference from, from my personal experience. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add to that essentially is the financial crime that used to happen in, you know, whether we do traded equities, you'd have fixed income products. The similar word is happening here in the decentralized world and decentralized world. Once decentralized world gets a little more mature in terms of offering different asset classes, you would see a little more structure in the centralized space where, you know, the tokens, there would be more controls built in there, there would be more uh, monitoring essentially. And the other problem that you would see is you know, countries like, you know, all the countries are now trying to participate in this whole area. So it's, it's going to be very similar in terms of drafting regulations, and you might have a central organization, like, you know, probably the World Bank steps in, or IMF steps in, or the SEC, as, you know, coming from, the, from America, I can, you know, SEC has to partner with other organizations to actually enforce a lot of controls and to prevent the similar kind of financial crimes you had in the derivatives world, like in the Lehman Brothers, you know, I mean, if we had all worked together, the Lehman Brothers wouldn't have happened. I mean, we wouldn't have had that debacle, and Bear Stearns wouldn't have gone down to $2 a stock. So if people have learned, and Dodd-Frank was a regulation that came out of it, if we learned our lessons from the financial world, and we apply them to this, in this world, and, but we have to kind of look at it in a more holistic perspective, because the people who are actually committing the crime are, you know, sitting in some small godforsaken village or somewhere, and tracking them and figuring them out is not an easy. You know, it was it's easy in the financial crime world because you at least knew they were traders, they were licensed. You could actually take away their license or, you know, have, find them. What do you do in such situations? So it's, it's in a bigger problem here. But we have to learn lessons from the financial world and apply them in this side of the world, essentially. Yeah, thank you, Sonia. Um, the things that I don't want to already dive in too much yet or what we can learn or how the global regulators or the big institutions can implement or kind of like tackle this down or this financial crime in the crypto market or in the financial market itself. Um, I'm just wondering also from personal experience, especially also from you, Alfio, um, you have a listed company, you've run an ICO yourself before. What are the pitfalls and what are the things you've learned running an ICO or so to the, avoid? The, the biggest problem about the ICO at the beginning was to cash the, the money because uh, all the financial institution was having problem in cashing out the money. So, and there was no uh, infrastructure for that at the, at the beginning. And thanks to the trust I gained from the IPO, the initial public offering I did for my company, I can translate the trust into the bank system and have a, a, an easy way to cash out the money. But in normal, the, most of the people that do the ICO, they are stuck into the, in, into the Bitcoin or Ethereum, and they cannot, it was very tough to convert. And many of the technology we bought, uh, or, or the people we need to pay, was pay in fiat currencies. So that was a very tough problem. And the other tough problem, we start accepting uh, Bitcoin uh, as a public company in uh, 2015. And the problem was the auditors. So KPMG, uh, uh, Ernest Young, or all the big Deloitte, all the big auditors, they, they don't understand what is a crypto. And they, uh, they have a huge fear of money laundering, uh, 
huge fear of a uh, problem about the transaction. But in the reality, the, when it comes to the reality, this is a very small problem because uh, at the moment, uh, in uh, four years, we never had any kind of problem about crime or people that, that try to buy something uh, illegally. We have more problem in the credit card systems. Uh, mm -hmm. So buying with the credit cards, uh, sometimes we have, uh, we have problem and, and we need to report them, yeah. All right, great. So I want to also give the floor to Sintan as well. Well, I think from my perspective with this, for any business, and when we look at the do's and don'ts and the changing face of, of, of doing business these days within finance, everything is all changing, but it's also the same. KYC, knowing your customer and customer due diligence, hasn't really changed. You still need to know your customer. You need to understand your customer. You need to truly vet them before they become a customer. It's not just a question of getting a copy of a passport, verification, of, a, um, of an address, because all you're doing there is ticking a box. And this is probably controversial at a fintech conference, but um, just taking an off-the-shelf package for somebody who's going to say, this will solve your KYC by buying something off the shelf, probably won't do. Because when the regulator comes calling and you show them your spreadsheet of this uh, list of ticked boxes, that doesn't really prove anything. So I think robust knowing your customer in this world, in the future, and in the past, has always been absolutely paramount. But also, just to append to that, knowing your customer doesn't stop any financial crime. It's effective transaction monitoring. So when the student opens the account with their student loan check, and then three months later, they're pushing thousands through their account, and your monitoring isn't noticing that, then you've probably got a problem there, because that student's doing more than they said they would. So I think the two fit neatly together. So you need robust systems. That's great, yeah. Um, at our community of ATZ Markets, we have a lot of readers. And um, they're just wondering why hasn't any of the governments or any of the big institutions step in to tackle this problem? So in your opinion, what would you suggest these governmental bodies to, to do or how to stop financial crime? in your eyes? I think, I think from the work I've seen, mainly in the UK, the first initial problem was one of understanding. I mean, you know, if we cast our mind back four or five years, we had different jurisdictions. In some places it was illegal. In other places, cryptocurrencies and crypto assets were positively encouraged. In certain jurisdictions, it was classed to be a currency. In others, it was a security. In others, it's a utility. In some countries, it was a, it was a property. So if you liquidated it, it was liable for capital gains tax. So you had the taxation systems, you had the regulatory systems, you had the legal systems, all singing and having different incentive structures with a political and media kind of reactionary core of surely this stuff is, is all bad and, and not seeing any of the good. And then mix that across a global level with different states running at different speeds. And you've got, generally speaking, a, a technology which is moving faster than the institutional structures can keep pace with. I mean, if you look back in history without being this sort of academic on the panel, although that's what I am, you look at, say, the history of radio. When radio first came about, that's exactly what happened. Different nation states, different radio stations did it in their own different way and moved very quickly. And then eventually, there was a global uniform agreement in terms of how this stuff should be regulated and brought together. So for my mind, it's not necessarily the case that you know, this technology doesn't have merit and, and, and it's a problem that it's treated in different ways. It's just that the technology is moving so fast relative to the pace and incentives of the, of the power brokers that control regulatory and tax structures as well. Yeah, and I actually have an experience to actually relate to that. When we were actually implementing the Dodd-Frank for derivatives, I mean, they had all the 3,000-page documentation. They wanted to make sure that another demon didn't happen. But, you know, we provided all the reporting, but, you know, the regulatory bodies couldn't handle all the reporting data that came in. So data is the new oil, and essentially, how are you going to manage the data? And that to globally, especially in this kind of a crypto crime, is, is something which all, I mean, all the different countries or exchanges at different levels have to kind of work together and come, come up with a standard process in terms of some kind of you know, certification in terms of if you're a Bitcoin trader or if you're, I mean, you're a crypto trader or if you're issuing a token or you're tokenization some kind of a service. You know, like for example, JP Morgan just instituted, I mean, they had a coin for payments that has come out. I mean, some of the clients are using it, but is there a secondary market for it? So till, you know, the secondary market also has to be monitored. 
and till the secondary market and primary market don't co-evolve, I mean, regulators are going to have a hard time coming up with you know, different kind of, you know, in terms of instituting and enforcing their regulations, essentially. Yeah, that's good. So, Alfio, maybe you can also share more um, about your experiences then as running the ICO. So the running the ICO, we, we decided to use Swiss as, uh, because it was the, the first uh, place in Europe, uh, also if it's not part of European community, that uh, start to have uh, legislation. From Italian point of view, it was a very big problem is because nobody understand anything. In, uh, so I think we, we need to come together as an industry to talk to the newspaper, to talk to the politician, in order to make them understand better our industry, because we need uh, to get rid of this kind of uh, bad uh, people because we are using the cryptocurrency. So it's look like all the crimes start and finish with crypto, but that's not the reality because uh, the, the fiat is so much bigger and so much more crimes and this is just a small part and probably they are micro payment most of the crime not uh, i don't think there, there will be very huge payment moving from bitcoin from one side to another so uh, and but as soon as something show up in the newspaper the the relevance and the and the focus of the media become larger and larger and uh, as an industry i think we need to help them to understand better the, our movement uh, and uh, to make the crypto world a real world also in, in the real life. Yes, I like your point. Uh, so in, in that essence, um, a lot of our readers also mentioned that maybe education is the key. Education of the current generation, education of the coming generation, of the millennials, etc., about the impact of but I think on that regard, the, the challenge with that education piece or hurdle is that you've genuinely got to be a polymath to understand this. You know, I'm a, I'm a financial economist. I specialize in trading. If someone said to me, can you code an ICO? I'd be like, I've got no clue at all. I can code time series and do statistics, but I can't create a coin. You know, you need to have a sociological understanding. You need to have a, a legal understanding, a tax understanding, a regulatory understanding, and, and no single individual in, institution has got the full repertoire of skill sets to get a handle on this, which is genuinely pervasive. And I think that's, that's one of the key reasons as to why we're struggling with it so much as an industry and also as a, as a global population as well. Yeah. So how would you turn that around <laughs> as an advisor or consultant to the government? I, I don't know. Do, I don't know. Do you not have it, a it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> a solution for us. Yeah. There. We yeah. need to have a James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I think it's a big problem because we are dealing with something is a worldwide, and after we have uh, local regulations, so it's it's probably it will need uh, years and years and years because the. The best uh, scenario is that we have one regulation worldwide, but this is technically impossible. So uh, that will be tough, mm. tough to regulate it. Yes, I, th I think while we wait for the uh, regulators to sort it out on a global basis, yeah. we, we should probably learn what we can from the financial crisis that, that uh, wonderful 10-year anniversary of that we're all celebrating. Um, learn from the mistakes of the past, you know, in, invest in the right systems, not just delegate responsibility to systems. Develop our own bespoke systems that work for our businesses so we truly understand not only who we're doing business with, but when something goes wrong, be it fiat or crypto, we're alerted to it and that we can have these open discussions. Yeah. And I think on, on that regulatory point as well, I think because there's so much value in this, it's, it's not going to disappear. You know, it has to be addressed at some point. And whether that's from positive regulatory changes or whether that's from under some of the external threats, such as a, another financial crisis, touch wood, it doesn't happen, but something like that happening and changing the way people use and interact with money and technology, it could force the regulators to act in order to be able to address that particular, that particular change. So there's one thing we could probably think of, I mean, in terms of the tech and the regulators working together, and you're coming up with an incentive-based model. So in terms of, for, the, for example, if the institutions, exchanges have to comply with the regulations, they get incentive in terms of, like, 
in terms of you know, the collateral requirements or in terms of you know, the, some kind of leeway tax leverages. If the regulators can come on an incentive-based mechanism, people will follow it. And if tech giants work with them, you know, if the Googles and Facebooks of the world, if they work with the regulators, come up with a system which is easy to use versus becoming cumbersome, and, and you know, work with the, you know, the regulators, operating systems, which is, in some ways, they, they haven't kept up with the times. So I think all the three, coming up with the incentive-based and keep, keep, keeping up with the times in terms of technology, that would, the whole, the triangle may actually speed up things, essentially. Just my two cents into it. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would like to thank the panel members for today. Thank you. And giving, thank providing you. the experts insights. Thank you.